Hello everyone, and welcome to the CircuitPython Weekly for February 8th, 2021. This is the time of the week when we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython and uh, Python on hardware related. Um, I'm Katni, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join that server anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. If the meeting time is changed, we'll notify you via Discord. If you wish to be notified about changes to the meeting, we can add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There's also a calendar that is available that we try to keep updated if you'd like to subscribe to that instead. This meeting is recorded. We record the audio from the voice channel and video of the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you are still welcome to participate. The video of this meeting will be posted to YouTube at Adafruit, uh, or, uh, youtube.com slash Adafruit and the voice or the audio is released as a podcast. If you find this podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, please let us know. There is a notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. If you wish to participate, but you don't have a microphone or you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you can add your updates to the notes doc and we'll read them off as we get to you. As well, if you wish to participate, but you can't make it to the meeting, you can leave hug reports and status updates for us in the document and we'll read them off during the meeting. The notes document also contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. This meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, so it gives you the option to skip around. If you're just listening in uh, and you are here during the meeting, please let us know that you are lurking and we'll skip over you. If possible, please add your name to the notes doc with lurking after it, otherwise let us know in the text channel so we can get the notes doc updated. It's important that your lurking status is in the notes doc because we use that uh, when we go through the list during the meeting. If you wish to speak during the meeting, you'll need to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. Please ask anyone in the meeting who is an admin or moderator to add you to the role if you are not already a member. If you don't want to be added to the role, you can still participate as text only. Simply let us know. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python on microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython at the libraries and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers and gives us an idea of the health of the project. Hug reports, the, next, the third part is hug reports. Hug reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize awesome folks in our community. This section is held as a round robin, the first of two, where we will begin with the person who is hosting. So I will start and then I will go through the list alphabetically, looping back to the top to give everyone who wants to a chance to participate. If you're lurking, I'll skip over you. If you're text only or missing the meeting and you left notes, I will read your notes when I get to you in the list. The fourth part is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to and uh, what we're going to be doing. Um, take a couple minutes to talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. It's also an opportunity for folks to provide helpful hints in response to other status updates. This section is also held as a round robin to give everyone who wants to a chance to participate. Again, if you're lurking, well, I'll skip over you. And if you're text only or are missing the meeting and have notes in the document, I'll read them when I get to you. The fifth and final part is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time is too long for status updates. If you have an in the weeds topic now, please add it to the notes doc along with your name in the in the weeds section at the end of the document. If you think of them during the meeting, please add them as you come up with them. This way we're not waiting around at the end to see if anyone has anything to discuss. When we get to in the weeds, I'll turn it over to whomever added the topic to begin the discussion. If you're text only, please make a note of it so I can read it off. And that covers how the meeting will go. So with that, um, we can get started with community news. Uh, community news is an overview of what's going on with um, Python on hardware in the community. So first up, discussions on the Raspberry Pi Pico board and RP2040 chip from the designers. 
Um, so there's uh, an article about our microcontroller for the masses. The Raspberry Pi Pico COO James Adams talks us through the company's first custom ARM chip designed in-house with ARM flexible access and now at the heart of the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, next up, software engineer Liam Fraser discusses the journey to Raspberry Silicon and the design process for the RP2040 chip. Following that, uh, Innovation Coffee did a Raspberry Pi Pico special by ARM software developers. A conversation with the Raspberry Pi CPO, Gordon Hollingsworth, hardware engineer Luke Wren, Gordon, Raspberry Pi employee number one, shares some interesting anecdotes of his time at Raspberry Pi and Luke walks through the hardware development of the new Raspberry Pi Pico. And finally, the Amp Hour podcast embedded hardware with the Raspberry Pi team. Uh, that is an episode of that, and um, that sums up all the Pico goodness uh, from the developers. Next up, the January 2021 Melbourne MicroPython meetup featuring Damian George. Um, they've posted their January videos. Matt Trentini provides a news update, and the key speaker is Damian George talking about the MicroPython port for Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, we have a, a display, a Raspberry Pi Pico overlay in Adafruit AR. A new feature in the Adafruit iOS AR app. If you have a Raspberry Pi Pico, you can now scan the board with Adafruit AR's board scanner to display a pinout and power pin overlay. Adafruit AR is, use, is using image tracking to locate the Raspberry Pi Pico board and then displays the pinout overlay. If you're able to see your, now you're able to see your pinouts even if your Raspberry Pi Pico is on a breadboard. Um, next up, hands-on with the Raspberry Pi Pico and CircuitPython. CircuitPython performance is pretty good, but a little below the speed of the Adafruit M4, which is uh, a similarly clocked Cortex-M4. Cortex-M0 has no floating point, so it has to do software floating point. Um, next up, uh, an article on using Adafruit CircuitPython with the Raspberry Pi Pico, details, pros, and cons. Following that, hacking Alibaba RGB beauty ring lights with SK6812 and white rings using a redesigned controller with the Raspberry Pi Pico and CircuitPython, and that's a Twitter thread. Following that, a LoRa Messenger and BlackBerry Pi form factor with a feather and circuit Python, and that's on Hackaday. And finally, a Raspberry Pi Pico soil moisture indicator with circuit Python, and that's from Andy Warburton. So this is a preview of the circuit Python um, or Python on Hardware newsletter, uh, which goes out every week. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash circuit Python. And to sign up, you can go to adafruitdaily.com. If you have any projects, news, or ideas that you would like to see added to the newsletter, um, you can make a PR. It is available on um, GitHub at uh, github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython dash weekly dash newsletter. Uh, or you can uh, tag at Ann underscore engineer on Twitter or email annb at adafruit.com. And thanks very much to Anne who puts together this newsletter every week. And that is community news. Next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire CircuitPython project, including the core, uh, the CircuitPython libraries, and our, um, our Blinka um, compatibility layer is the phrase I'm looking for. <laughs> Uh, for single board computers. Uh, we'll talk about the whole project overall, and then I will turn it over to Scott to talk about the core. I will talk about the libraries, and Melissa will talk about Blinka. So first of all, overall, we had 30 pull requests merged from 22 authors. Um, a few new names I'm seeing there are uh, Bumblebee Man, Luminous Owl, Bonne, SAK917, and Ferret Guy. And uh, we had 12 reviewers on those 30 pull requests. Uh, and we've had 27 issues closed by 13 people and 29 opened by 21 people. So we are up a little bit on issues, which is absolutely fine. And it's excellent to see that there's so many people involved in both closing and opening all of those issues. So with that, I will turn it over to Scott to talk about the core. Hello. Thank you, Katni. You're welcome. 
Okay, for the core, uh, we had three pull requests merged from seven different authors. Uh, that's largely due to translation updates, I assume. So thank you to uh, Ferret Guy and Bubble Bee Man here uh, as some new names in here. Uh, we had three re three reviewers, so thanks to our reviewers. We have 22 open pull requests, which is uh, climbing up a bit. Uh, so as always, let's make sure and take a look, especially if you have one that's been open a while, uh, let's make sure that the, the ones that have been open a while have uh, planned to go forwards, and if not, uh, we can close them. We can always reopen them, them them later, so let's not be scared to close things if they don't have a a way to go forwards uh, in the near term. Um, issues wise, we had two closed issues by one person and eleven open by eight people. So sorry in advance uh, for uh, adding more issues, but we we are seeing uh, a lot of new folks for the RP twenty forty, aka the Pico. Um, we have 399 total open issues, uh, and the way, the way that we kind of are okay with that number growing is that we, we have a, a bucket called long-term, which is a, a milestone that basically is like, yeah, that's a good idea, but we have no plans on doing it, uh, soon. Uh, so we have 314 open issues there. We have six issues that are not assigned to milestone, so we should definitely take a look at those and figure out, uh, what their severity is. And then uh, we have, I don't know, maybe a few dozen uh, six related issues as well, which are the ones that we, we hope to do sooner rather than later. Um, and Jeff points out that long-term doesn't mean we don't want a community member picking it up and working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Generally, um, when I talk about the prioritization for our, uh, our stuff, it, it's the prioritization within Adafruit for what we want to work on. Uh, but again, if any other folks, uh, community or paid by other companies ideally want to work prioritize differently uh, then that's totally cool and we'd love to see uh, issues get knocked out and uh yeah overall uh well you should see another beta this week with some really good fixes both for usb thanks to tac and dan uh, but also for uh some fixes for the rp2040 uh thanks to a, a number of folks so expect to see that um and uh, we'll keep rolling in the betas for a while, I think, while we add more stuff for the RP2040. All right. And that's it for us. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next up is the libraries. So this covers all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, as well as a few other, uh, a few other things. Um, and so that's every library that begins with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore and also things like our cookie cutter and um, the community bundle are included here. Um, so we had 22 pull requests merged from 14 authors and 10 reviewers. Um, all of those were a week or less old and that leaves us with uh, 70 open pull requests, which is up, but that's because we missed a few in our um, initial CI sweep. And so uh, we needed to go back and do those. So that's why that number is, is a lot higher than, than usual. And um, we had 23 issues closed by 13 people and 16 open by 12 people. So we are net down and that leaves us with 281 open issues. Uh, eight of those are labeled good first issues. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, you can go to circuitpython.org slash contributing. You will find a list of all the open pull requests, a list of all the open issues, and a list of library infrastructure issues, as well as uh, instructions on how, or the information on how to um, contribute to the CircuitPython core by translating. Um, in terms of the library bits, uh, the best place to start is either take a look at the open PRs and just see whether there's anything you can test or check for syntax errors or that sort of thing. Um, or check the issues. If you are new to everything, good first issue is an excellent thing to search for. If you are, um, or if you are looking for something a little more complicated, bug or enhancement are both good as well. Um, and just comment on the issue and let us know that you're going to be working on it. Um, if you're new to Git and GitHub, we have a guide on contributing. And we also are available on Discord to answer questions. So don't let that intimidate you. We want to see you be able to contribute in whatever way works best for you. So just let us know. Um, and in terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had one new library, Adafruit Circuit Python Simple Math. 
And um, yes, this was formerly part of Simple.io. However, Simple.io required another built-in module um, that isn't available on all the boards. And uh, most of the time folks are using it for this math function anyway. So we separated it out um, to have a separate place to get, uh, to get the math function without requiring simple IO. Um, and that's thanks to Dan for doing that. And then that's what I've got for the library. So next up, uh, Melissa uh, can talk about Blinka. Hey, sorry, wrong button. <laughs> Uh, so I, uh, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for Raspberry Pi and other single board computers. Uh, this week we had five pull requests merged by four authors and three reviewers. Um, there are uh, five open pull requests left between all the different Blinka libraries, and there were two closed issues by two people and two open by two people, leaving a net of 52 open issues. Uh, there were 1,224 PyPI downloads in the last week, and we are currently supporting 67 boards. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you. And that is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to recognize the awesome work that folks are doing in our community. It gives everybody a chance to call out uh, anything good that folks have done, um, perhaps while working with them, perhaps uh, something as simple as appreciating a, a review is all the way up to writing some code, you know, whatever it is that, that you want to point out um, that folks have done, uh, this is the section slash time to do it. This section is held as a round robin. I will start and then I will go down the list alphabetically. I have um, some folks who are not attending or who are lurking who added notes to the document and I will read those off in alphabetical order as I would um, or as, as we would if, if I were to call on them. And so if you um, are not lurking, I will start and then I will call on you alphabetically as we go. Um, just bear in mind that I might be notes between you and the next person um, on the list. And then once I get to the bottom, I'll loop back around and um, we'll follow through until everybody has a chance to um, give their hug reports. So with that, I will get started. So first up, a uh, hug to Foamy Guy and Kmatch98 for all their work on the Display IO layout library. I haven't had a chance to dig into the PRs. Um, the responses yet, but uh, I saw a lot of flurry going on there. Uh, to Mark Gambler for adding Adafruit bus device, I think that's who added Adafruit bus device to the core. Um, I realize this is a sort of belated hug report, but I fell into finding it <laughs> accidentally last week, which was excellent um, to see that that was working. To Dylan for continuing to handle all the library CI updates. To ask Patrick W. for their work on getting cookie cutter more streamlined and more community bundle friendly. To Crayola for helping me get a not yet implemented new theme going on my website. And finally to Carter, Mr. Certainly, and Phil M. for sponsoring me on GitHub. Next up I have notes from Kevin Thomas who says group hugs. And next up is Kmatch98. Hey, thanks Katni. Uh, a lot of warm hugs this week. So uh, starting off with Foamy Guy and Katni on the uh, initial work on grid layout. Uh, particularly Katni, thanks for the clarifications. I hope it'll make it easier to understand uh, how to use that one. Um, next was to Lady Ada for, uh, Lady Ada for uh, suggesting how to solve a, uh, a crash I was getting with the focal touch library. Uh, and that seemed to work out fine. Uh, next is to Jay Posada 2020. He goes by uh, many different names, I think, but that's his GitHub name. Uh, but uh, he added text baseline, uh, so that basically you could align different fonts along one common baseline. So uh, typesetting should be uh, superior to achieve with that. Uh, next, Foamy Guy for uh, for a great live stream. So uh, especially he found a lot of good things to fix. In particular, I like uh, your your manner for uh, uh, giving feedback in a constructive way. Hey, we're all in this together and trying to make things better. So appreciate the appreciate your style there. 
Uh, next, uh, Foamy Guy and Hugo for how to set up Blinka, uh, particularly on Mac OS. So I uh, finally am learning how to do that. So that was that was use, useful to get me up and started and, and for writing it down so it's easy to understand. And last, J Guitar for bitmap blip testing and uh, demoing a cool moon phase display at the same time. Thanks, thanks everybody. Excellent. Thank you. Next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Let's see here. Uh, I wanted to give a hug report uh, first to uh, oh, where, let's see. Uh, to Brent uh, for your help with the ESP Home. Uh, to everyone who's been submitting Blinka PRs and a group hug to everyone else. Excellent. Thank you. Next up, I have notes from Mark Gambler, who's lurking, who says a hug report to Jerry for finding and helping me work on issues with bus device in the core and a NeoPixel RP2040 problem and a group hug. And next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, first, a huge hug to all the new folks. Um, we've been having a lot of new folks coming in. Uh, I think it's been a mix of ESP32 S2 and uh, RP2040. So just a shout out to Jay for CN, Xorbit, Jay Posada 202020, Lenart Piro, Luminous Owl, Hari, KRS013, Ywang83, Dexter Starbird, and everyone else who's been helping them. Uh, really cool to see lots more folks involved. Um, Wildest Pixel on uh, oh, and I, I just remembered another one. While this pixel on Twitter has been getting a lot of uh, Circuit Python stuff going with the Pimer and Pico stuff, and has been posting to the Raspberry Pi forums as well. The one that I forgot is that there's a user on the Pi forums called Hippie who's been actually being very helpful to a lot of folks there with Circuit Python questions. So thanks to them. And lastly, uh, hug report to Mark Gambler for following up with the native bus device fixes. I know it can be kind of a a challenge to go back to code you thought you were done with, uh, but I'm very excited to have native bus device in there. And thank you for following up on that stuff. And uh, always uh, thanks to Jerry for testing as well. Excellent. All right, next up is TG Techie. Um, hi everyone, I have two hugs. It is a hug for Katni for a conversation about uh, pull requests. I very much appreciate it. And a group hug. It's such an awesome community to be a part of. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Next up, I have some notes that I will read off. First up, notes from Anik Data, who has a hug for Naradoc for fixing HTTP while I slept. Yay, global, global community. And a hug for Hire Effect, Brent Rue. Tan Newt and many others for code, chats, reviews, etc. to get native networking flushed out. I have some more notes here from Ask Patrick W, who says thanks to Maker Melissa for the Circup PR review. Next up is Dan. Okay, thanks. Um, so thanks to Weiwing83 Destiny's Agent and uh, 0x414B for testing. Um, an issue that came up with the uh, Raspberry Pi RP2040, in which if you use pin, pin GP15, sometimes your REPL doesn't work, sometimes code.py doesn't restart automatically, and various other confusing problems. And so we brought this to the attention of Raspberry Pi, and Scott proposed a fix, and they did put in a fix, and uh, we incorporated that into a build, but I tried testing it myself and I could not really reproduce the problem. So I passed them the build back to them and they tested it and said, it works great now. So that's really terrific because I was not in a position to be able to test it. Um, thanks to Scott for talking with me last week about the secondary USB channel, um, USB serial channel uh, API from Python, we worked out, a, I think, a good solution to that. Um, thanks to JF Abernathy, who's been testing some uh, confusing ESP32 as to sleep problems. Basically, it thinks that it browned out when it comes out of a deep sleep sometimes. And also thanks to Igor, IGRR, who uh, pointed out that some other people had this problem and he's trying to get a fix into the 
ESP SDK, but we have a workaround for now. Um, thanks to Katni, who, when writing in the RP2040 uh, guides or guides, um, found some things that needed more explanation in the original CircuitPython guides because now we sort of have more cases like pins and other pin names and other things like that. So thanks for moving that stuff into the main guide. Um, thanks to Xorbit and Ferret Guy, who added some uh, needed pins onto the RPI. Uh, Pico um, board definition. And thanks to Nerodoc for helping out a whole lot on Discord and also for doing some uh, network socket fixes. Okay. All right, thanks. Next up, I have notes from David Gloud, who has a hug report for Dishipu for porting Vacuum Invader to Display I.O., uh, Jay Forsian for the WeChuck Accessories Library, to KJW for a great article on UART protocol of PM25, and to James Bowman for bootstrapping me on Game Duino and the port to the Pico. Next up is to Shipu. Sorry. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, I grab a group hug because I haven't been active for a while and they attention but I can see that a lot of great work is happening before all that. All right well thanks for coming back. <laughs> all right next up is Foamy Guy. All right uh, this week got a bunch of hugs to pass out. Um, to start with Jay Podesta 202020 on GitHub I think Jose might be their name on um, Discord. Um, did some uh, has done a bunch of a bunch of great work lately. Truthfully, um, they made some nice documentation updates for display text label, um, and they also worked on the baseline alignment for label, which will allow us to set different labels with different size fonts together and have them line up correctly uh, without having to do a bunch of like guess and checking of pixels. So that's really nice. Um, GitHub user, um, I'm probably going to mess up the the pronunciation, unfortunately, but it's like less and more. Apuriapiri, sorry, I got it in the in the doc here. But they um, digged into an issue around scaling, uh, specifically with display text label scaling. At one point, we noticed on Blinka Display IO it gets doubled up, um, and we, we couldn't really figure out what what the deal was. But they dug into it and got a potential fix um, in the works. So that's really cool. To uh, K Match ninety eight for uh, getting a really great start on the sort of support you know, support like uh, super classes that we will use in the display IO layout library, as well as for um, digging into some issues in uh, Blinka display IO, like potential differences between dis uh, Blinka display IO and the core that were causing some trouble with uh, the round switch um, to Hugo for working on refactoring the progress bar and making a vertical uh, variation of it. Um, also, I forgot to note it down here, but Hugo also uh, wrote down the steps for uh, changing uh, Git remotes, which was really helpful to me. It was something that came out of one of my streams, so I appreciate that as well. And then lastly, uh, to um, BCR for making uh, real quick work of a change in the Blinka CLI tool that allows it to output fonts that are uh, having the new uh, ascent and descent properties that we make use of now in the latest versions of the library. So uh, big thanks there. And that's all for me. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Next up, I have some notes from Gary Z, who has a hug report, to Hugo for working on the vertical progress bar and hopefully the radial progress bar, a gauge. And next up is Higher Effect. Um, all right, big thanks uh, this week to Naradoc for uh, their socket issues and recent PR um, for some socket stuff and other things. Um, Thanks to uh, Anic Data for uh, just continuously spread uh, testing all of the stuff in Socket and verifying a whole bunch of bugs and uh, having discussions. Um, he's just been everywhere. Really appreciate it. Um, Starwitch for finding a pretty serious issue with the Socket types, which was usually resolved, but it was good to, to be notified of that. Uh, thanks, Dan, for a discussion on input sanitation in the common how layer. And thanks to Scott for reviews. And that's it for me. All right, excellent. Next up, I have notes from Hugo, who has a hug report for to Foamy Guy for the interim code review, to Katni and Diharada for getting the license information updated in the Straggler repositories, 
to Scott for the informational deep dive and group hugs. Thank for the friendly, helpful and welcoming community. And next up is Jeff. Hello. Um, so I was just doing research about what that uh, person's name could possibly mean, and I was a little distracted. Um, but uh, I was out last week, so there's a lot that people probably deserve hug reports that I missed. But I particularly wanted to thank uh, Mark and Jerry for their research on the RP2040 NeoPixel problem. And give a hug to my local friends, Josh and Harry, who are both beginning with CircuitPython. Uh, Harry just in the last couple of weeks, and Josh for a little bit longer. And I know Harry has joined us here on Discord and has had a project in the newsletter a couple of weeks ago. Congratulations. You're off to a great start. And finally, a group hug. Excellent. Thank you. Next up is Jerry. Yeah, hi. Um, so yeah, thanks to Mark and Jefferson and Jeff you for uh, all the work that everyone's been doing on this RP2040 NeoPixel issue. And uh, it's been a good challenge. And, uh, and everybody involved in the in the amazingly rapid development of all the support for the RP2040 in CircuitPython. Um, lots of fun to be had. And uh, Mark, another thank you to you for uh, the quick fix you did to the uh, NATO bus device issue that cropped up. Thanks. All right. And with that, we are done with hug reports. So next up is status updates. Uh, so status updates is an opportunity for us to sync up on what we've been up to since the last meeting and what we're going to be up to until the next meeting. It's also an opportunity for folks to give helpful hints, tips and tricks, that sort of thing in response to others' um, status updates. So if you have quick questions and folks have quick answers, uh, this is a great place for it. And remember, if something turns into a more long form discussion, we can move it to in the weeds. Status updates is held as a round robin again. I will start and I'll go through the list alphabetically, reading off notes where I have them and including folks who are present in the meeting um, to read off their status, their own status updates. Um, so, oh, and feel free to include any kind of fun stuff you've been working on as well. We have heard about uh, folks doing uh, bathroom remodeling, for example. Um, we just wanna know what you're up to. So with that, I will get started. Um, so last week I finished up the Spy Flash SD card guide. Uh, it's a neat little SPI board that has a surface mount uh, chip on it that is basically an SD card. So it works with all of the SD card libraries as is. Uh, so there's no um, changes necessary. You just wire it up and it's, and it's good to go. Um, so it's a neat little chip. Um, I added a new page to the CircuitPython Essentials Guide on using board, uh, import board, how it works, why it works, how CircuitPython finds pins, um, all stuff that uh, we kind of take for granted, but we've never bothered to explain. So, and also uh, explaining the built-in modules and how to find out what built-in modules are available for your board. Um, we've had some questions lately, you know, hey, I'm supposed to import digital I.O., but I can't find it in the bundle. Um, hopefully this page will address that issue in the sense that it's not in the bundle, it's built into CircuitPython, etc. And I also published the ST, HT40 guide, which I believe is a humidity and temperature sensor. So this week, um, the getting started with Raspberry Pi Pico and CircuitPython guide content is finally live. Um, the guide itself was made live with just the pinouts and the um, a link to the CircuitPython Essentials Guide uh, because we needed to go through and do some finalization on the examples. So now all the examples are present in the guide. Um, so I need to blog uh, the SHD40 guide release, the Pico guide uh, release, and then also the Essentials Guide as updated. Um, there's one screenshot that needs to go into that Essentials page and then I need to mirror it into every board guide so that all the guides that have CircuitPython Essentials mirrored into it We'll also have this page mirrored in. Um, there is one final page that I need to finish in the getting started with Pico guide, which is on data logging, um, using the you know CircuitPython file system to log the temperature from the CPU. Um, we just didn't have time to do it initially, and so I need to circle back and do that. There are two topics that came out of writing 
the Pico guide. One is the explanation of CircuitPython or the CircuitPy file system use and an explanation of what CircuitPython does when your code ends. Those two things were included in the Raspberry Pi Pico guide, but definitely have a home in the Welcome to CircuitPython guide. So I need to add those two topics somewhere. I'll figure out where. Um, the FeatherSense guide has a pinouts page and the layout that we used is a little difficult to read. So I need to fix the layout on that. Um, and then there's two new boards that are live in the shop, I believe. The ISO 1540 and the AW9523, and both of those need guides. And then finally, once all of that is done, um, I need to circle back and finish up the PRs for the final set of um, CI updates. Um, if any of our intrepid reviewers want to take on those PRs, feel free. Um, I'm tagged as the reviewer, but it does not have to be me. Um, and I did not make a note, but I'm still working on um, my new website. Uh, and I posted three posts on uh, kind of getting started with Pelican. It's not, um, Pelican is a static site generator that runs on Python. Um, the posts are not a tutorial because their documentation is, is really good. Um, it's more the workflow that I ended up with and um, it's more the workflow that I ended up with and just all the issues I ran into and what my solutions were um, in hopes that, you know, it'll help somebody out who possibly runs into the same issues. Um, and so, yeah, if you're interested in, in spinning up a website that you want to put extra work into and not use WordPress, um, Pelican's a great place to begin. Um, and that's what I've been up to. So uh, I believe next up is Kmatch98. All right. Thanks, Katni. So first off, uh, last week I had added an interrupt pin. This is uh, for the capacitive touch display. Uh, the Adafruit cells it uses a focal touch library. Uh, it was um, uh, some, somehow with the read and write, so we're getting fouled up. And if you asked to read when it wasn't ready, it would crash. So I gave an option to um, add an interrupt so you'd know there was data ready uh, when you could read it, and that seemed to work. Um, and then the rest of the items are related to widgets, basically graphical elements that to somehow respond to touch or just show something on the screens. Um, so the first off of those was I, um, uh, I uh, used these super class definitions that were kind of batting around or are working to define the widgets and controls, and I um, made my switch that I had, uh, had working. Uh, uh, and conform to the those class definitions that we're getting, as well as some other other cleanups in the process. Uh, also added a dial gauge display widget, so as a it doesn't have any touch response, but just shows shows a value. Uh, and uh, so I'm working on that one too. Um, also, and I guess in a related note, uh, I found some code from from way back, the, uh, and the the history is unknown. But basically, it, it copies a bitmap, but it also includes rotation, scaling, and clipping options. So that may be a good good help if you're doing some widget designs where you need need to move some text around or, or something like that. Um, okay, so this week uh, I wanted to spend some more time with the grid layout, which is to be used to help design these GUIs in a in a quick and easy manner. So see uh, see how that thing's working and give any good feedback I can. Uh, also, I uh, need to adjust my switch so it conforms better to the grid layout. Uh, then, uh, actually, I may have more questions on this one of how to document all these class structures. It seems fairly unwieldy to be working in these Word documents when maybe, uh, or, or uh, sorry, mark, markdown documents when maybe it could automatically be generated by just putting in the, the comments in a, in a fake, uh, fake class document and use Sphinx. So I may put some questions in the in the chat later with the Sphinx or sometime later this week how to generate those. Uh, then just want to improve my uh, dial gauge so it, it will fit in with the grid layout function to resize uh, automatically. And then I want to try and, and uh, put that uh, bitmap blip uh, with all the other options into the core and see how, how it'll work in there. And that's it. Excellent. Um, yeah, feel free to let me know anytime you have questions about Sphinx. Um, okay. All right, cool. Yeah, so you can ping me directly if you want to. Okay, will do. Thanks. All right. 
Um, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. So last week I worked on getting a guide, or I got a guide for using CircuitPython with Home Assistant published. I spent most of my time learning the ins and outs of using ESP Home and Home Assistant. And I got um, ESP Home to compile onto the ESP32S2. And this week I'm working on a nice square C issue related to that because that was having some issues. And I am looking into an issue with the Raspberry Pi OS and the 1.14 inch mini Pi TFT display. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you. Next up, I have notes from Microdev, who says, working on NVM and busio.uart implementation for RP2040. And there are two links to uh, Microdev's uh, work um, in the notes document. And that means next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, sounding like a bit of a broken record, which is, I guess, an audio joke. Har har. Uh, I made good progress on audio. I've been doing it the last few weeks. Uh, I can play back single looped 8-bit samples. OK, but I have to fix 16-bit. And then I have to test with non-looped examples. It's all about uh, sample conversion in DMA. Uh, so this week's more audio work. Uh, hopefully, we'll PRB the end of the week is my goal. Um, yeah, plus all the odds and ends of, of support and uh, PR reviews and stuff that I do normally. So that's it for me. Excellent. Thank you. Next up is TG Techie. Hello. Let me put my notes. OK. So uh, last week, I've been doing a lot of work on the watch when not back in school. I've submitted a pull request to add simple round recs to Adafruit display shapes. It's an implementation of round rect that's a little less flexible, but um, requires a lot more RAM. There's some interesting things I found along the way, but those are all covered in the PR. I, um, I got a friend to agree to beta test one of the watches, and he's helping me find uh, solutions for some of the four known bugs. I've been working on a not dumb-ish smartwatch for the past eight, eight, nine months, um, maybe a year. Goes by so fast. And um, found some workarounds for RAM limitations on the NRF52840 that I'm working with in the watch. Also, um, retroactive hug for, for, I believe it was, I don't remember who just said it, um, but someone who's adding interrupts to the touchscreen library. That's super awesome. I will be downloading and trying that today. Um, and I have a quick question, uh, that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's better here than in the weeds. Yeah. When, when building libraries into CircuitPython, mm -hmm. if we want to update a version of a library, do we need to manually remove the previous sub-module and add a new one? So it updates the commit number or? No. No, what you, go ahead. Um, if you do, so you're talking about um, like libraries that exist in the bundle? Uh, no, yes. Adafruit no, fr frozen, frozen oh, into CircuitPython. Oh, right? frozen into that. CircuitPython, yes. Um, yeah. you, the, it needs to be updated. Like the, the sub, you don't need to remove it, but the submodule does need to be updated. Okay. Thank you. That is all. All right. Have a great week. Yeah, you too. Um, next up, I have notes, I think. Yeah. Um, from Ask Patrick W who says, I'm going to continue my work on the cookie cutter library template, hopefully finished by the end of the week. I lost my Mac during a big Sir upgrade and had to get a new one. So I'm going to be slow for a bit. Okay. Um, all right, next up is Dan. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, I'm working on a secondary CDC, uh, secondary USB serial channel. It's called secondary CDC. 
So the idea is that you can talk to the host computer without the REPL getting in the way. So uh, originally we thought we had to turn off some other USB device to make this fit, but it turns out that we were actually, because of a bug, we were skipping um, one of the, what's called a USB endpoints that uh, most boards have. Like most boards have at least eight endpoints. A few don't, like the STM boards. And so um, it turned out that we don't have to add any code right now to turn off something in order to turn on the secondary channel, which means we can just leave that work until later, which is great because it's it's complicated. So um, I, I, I redid the way you turn devices on and off. Um, and I'll have to change the guide that explains how to do that when this gets PR. And then on Friday, I discussed the API with Scott and probably what we'll have is a, USB, a new top-level module called USB CDC, which will just have an attribute that is this new um, binary uh, stream that you can read and write to, and it'll have read line and how many characters are left and that kind of thing. Um, another another thing that I'm doing is that I'm spending a lot of time just keeping track of all the bugs that we want to fix for the next beta. Not, I'm not necessarily fixing them myself. A few of them I'm just like submitting PRs to incorporate other people's fixes. So um, that included this GP15 pin problem on RP 2040, which seems to be fixed. Uh, an issue with when the ASP32 S2 wakes up from deep sleep, it would sometimes wake up as if it thought that it had just powered up, which was con confusing the program that was running. And also uh, a long-term problem we had with stalls writing large files to CircuitPy. Sometimes they would just, when you copied it, they would just, it would take many minutes for it to copy the files for no good reason. So all those things have been fixed, it appears, and will be in the next beta. And finally, uh, what I'm gonna do this week is the first thing is that there seems to be an issue with the SD card library about it not working properly with Adafruit, the new native Adafruit bus device support, and that's the SD card library needs some rework. We could, we don't have to fix anything, it looks like. Um, then I we noticed that the RP2040 has some I2C issues with a few devices. These might be, this might be due to the way the libraries are written, so I will look at the problem. We have two different uh, issues covering that stuff. And then sometime this week, I'll prepare another 6.2.0 beta, which won't necessarily include any more changes than are there already, but it's time for another one to fix a bunch of problems. We'll just have plenty of betas. It's easy to make a beta, so we will do that as much as possible. Okay. That's it. All right. I think. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Next up, I have notes from David Gloud. This is PR and testing on the PIO ASM, playing demo of game Duino GD, GD3X Dazzle on HDMI, playing Vacuum Invader from Deshifu. Dan, can you mute? Um, porting UDRAW and mouse emulation to the new WeChuck library from JFirstian, and reading KJW article on UART protocol of PM25. Next up is Deshifu. Okay, so I, I finished uh, a new version of PewPew uh, prototype. It's, this one is called PewPew Slim, and it's uh, about one millimeter thick. So it uses individual uh, LEDs as the display, and uh, even doesn't have a USB socket because that was too thick so it's just a 0.6 millimeter uh, thick uh, pcb with a with a with the pads in there or you can use you can insert that into a micro usb okay. uh, i won't be i won't be uh, producing this uh, this was just for fun to see how it works it doesn't work well enough for me to continue this but it was a fun experiment uh, next one is uh, I have this city Python based keyboard that I made 
myself and uh, I left the middle of the keyboard empty for uh, for expansion modules. I just made the first expansion module for it. It has a joystick for mouse emulation, some buttons and an uh, and encoder knob for, for scrolling. Uh, yeah, I still work on the media ocarina thing where you basically I want a, a woodwind controller for for playing a MIDI device so that I, my neighbors don't have to complain when I practice <laughs> playing an ocarina. And uh, yeah, I, it's uh, hardware is mostly done. I will need to make one more revision to do some fixes on it. But uh, I still need to write all the software. And MIDI for anything that is not a piano is a bit uh, complicated. And uh, yeah, then in the future, I want to focus a little bit more on games on uh, Circuit Python. I want to port some of my old games to Circuit Python, and I want to maybe write some new ones. We will see. That's it for me. All right, thank you. Next up, I have notes from Foamy Guy, who says, last week, checked out several display I.O. related changes in the works, ver vertical progress bar, label baseline alignment, and display I.O. layout structure classes and other examples. Looked into an issue resulting from fonts missing ascent and descent properties. Made a PR to fix building circuit Python when bitmap font library is installed in the environment. Thank you to Jeff. This week, test out the display text uh, label scaling fix and review, leave a review on the PR. Revisit some of the above display I.O. changes to check out new things done since I last looked. And look into potential difference between palette objects in display I.O. Blinka compared to the ones in the core. Uh, next up is higher effect. Oh, can you hear me? I can. I can. Oh, sorry about that. I had my mute on. Um, uh, this past week, I got started on I squared C and low power issues. Uh, just kidding. I mostly worked on socket bugs, like I've been doing forever. Um, I fixed a set of issues with the on the requests library uh, with Anic Data and um, some of the other folks who have been helping out testing that. Thanks to them again. Uh, and I rewrote all my testing sketches to do a better job of kind of preemptively detecting issues as we make changes uh, across the socket and networking modules uh, in general. Um, I think we've caught basically everything now, um, all of the basic stuff anyway. Um, but uh, there's still probably going to be some issues, especially with the SSL socket module. So I'll be keeping an eye out for more things on that. Um, and. Uh, yeah, wrapped up the week by just fixing a couple other minor bugs. And um, I did actually work a bit on Iceberg C and low power. <laughs> um, wasn't all socket stuff. Um, so this week, uh, I'm just get, I'm going to be moving on to trying to wrap up this uh, Iceberg C thing, um, trying to get a full scope of low power issues that are available. Um, but in general, I'm flexible. So if there's anything else that comes up that's higher priority, I can work on that. Um, and uh, I'll just be keeping an eye on what's going on. And I also learned how to make sourdough bread, which was fun. Nice. Uh, so that's it for me. All right, excellent, thank you. Next up, I have some notes from Hugo, uh, who says, last week, some progress on the progress bar update, namely refactor. This week, finish up progress bar refactor, add in support for vertical progress bar, Finish writing up instructions from Foamy Guy on how to convert a library from a single module to a package with several modules, packages, and we'll pass along to Foamy Guy to include in the creating and sharing a circuit Python library learn guide. And next up is Jeff. Hello again. So uh, last week I took the week off. So I played around learning some more KiCad and FreeCAD, and it's great to be leveling up in those open source design uh, software packages. I also read a novel and some short stories and did some 3D printing. And it was it was nice for a, for a staycation where the temperature may not have gotten above freezing. It was, it was a good time. Uh, anyway, I did um, 
trick myself into looking at the message compression in CircuitPython again. And I think I have 200 bytes uh, of storage that we can get back by tweaking that a little bit. So next time things fill up, maybe I'll bring that out. Anyway, two weeks ago, I don't really remember. It was kind of all over the place. But I was most excited about making my first pull request into Adafruit Blinka, which got a good uh, positive review. And so I merged it this morning. And it will show in the stats next cycle, I think. So this week, I've been catching up on what I missed here in the meeting. Uh, my focus is going to be on learning and extending the PIO functionality on the RP2. I already blogged a couple of learn-related items that just uh, the guide pages or guide had been released, uh, but it hadn't been blogged, so that went out this morning. And uh, as we kind of discussed, I made my own slightly different version of the bug fix for the RP2040 NeoPixel problem. And uh, I guess that may still not fix it entirely, so we'll have to discuss that a little later. And then um, a friend of mine reports that they couldn't install ESP tool on an M1 Mac, something to do with the crypto library. If you know something about it, let me know in the text chat. I don't have an M1 Mac. I won't have an M1 Mac, but it would be good to get an issue filed somewhere about it because this is going to impact other people. Um, he had loaded CircuitPython already from a real computer, uh, so he didn't actually need ESP tool and isn't stuck. And of course, the web ESP tool is also probably the better option for Windows or for uh, for Mac people in general, I think, due to the difficulties around using PIP and Brew and Python and those things. Um, but still, it'd be good to get this noted down somewhere like with good technical information. So yeah, uh, sorry about that snark leaking out. I think a real computer is a Linux computer. So really, I was insulting the bulk of you. Uh, and that's all I've got. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Next up is Jerry. Oh, so let's see. Last week, I uh, just continued doing a whole bunch of playing around with the RP2040, and mostly in the, on the Pico, and um, you know, stumbled across this NeoPixel issue. And um, and so hopefully it's, it's getting close to resolution, and we'll talk about it in, in the weeds a little bit more. Um, and um, also stumbled across another issue with the native bus device. I feel badly. I keep <laughs> finding things with it. But... Um, you know, a, a, a driver that just hadn't been hadn't been tested yet. Um, stumbled it. And it was using a function that wasn't hadn't been fully tested. So uh, Mark did a quick fix to that, and that's that's now in place. Um, again, stumbling across things. Um, you know, for a while there's been a problem with the BrainCraft hat, um, where the newer Raspberry Pi kernel made the screen do f funky things. Well, now it's gotten even worse, and it won't even compile when you run the um, install script. So I'm just following the issue on that, hoping that comes to resolution at some point. I don't really want to have to revert to kernels, but we'll see. And oh yeah, there was a really nice post in Show and Tell showing how to use a mag tag for people who have um, solar panels that are monitored by this uh, company called Solar Edge. Um, that um, that they just they were able to hook into the their their API to download uh, information to the um, mag tag. And um, display it, um, and um, it was really, really nice, simple, you know, nice, very simple uh, you know, example. And uh, I just had no idea that Solar Edge had an API that people could access through through Python. And uh, so it was really nice to have an example. I've been playing with it ever since, um, and um, now I have mine set up so that it gets the data and then feeds it to my uh, Adafruit I/O site, so I can keep an eye on it that way. It's really been a nice little project. Next week, uh, probably just keep playing with the Raspberry Pi, I mean the RP2040, and um, then whatever else distracts me in some direction. And for fun, I got my first COVID-19 vaccine. Yay. So excellent. Uh, being an old fart has some advantages. <laughs> <laughs> that it does. All right. Thank you, everyone. That is status updates, uh, which brings us to In the Weeds. Um, So In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions that may or may not have come out of status updates. Um, and uh, if you come up with anything while we're having the rest of these In the Weeds topics, please add them. We do have a number of them listed. Uh, for each one, I will turn it over to the person who uh, posted the topic, um, unless they are listed as uh, lurking, in which case I will read it off. But um, I will. Um, 
turn it over to whomever and then um, we will go through it, etc. And that's how In the Weeds works. So first up, uh, I have a topic from Jeff. Hi. Um, so up front in the meeting each time, the host tells us about how the meeting is going to go. And a lot of that is only relevant to people who are in the meeting and not people who are watching it on YouTube. And uh, I was contemplating the idea of making a document detailing it. Um, I know, you know, we've said new people, it's good to have them hear the rules the first time around. And so I just wanted, before I embarked on making this document, do we think that the document would be useful to have? Could we reduce the intro text if we have it? And then um, do we want to standardize a little more on is it the, the, the lurkers or the speakers who have a duty to add things to the notes document? Because I know I do that a little bit different than you two. Um, and if you want to talk about this after the meeting, just the three of us, uh, rather than here in this format, that's fine too. Um, here's fine. Um, okay. I, I mean, I, regardless of whether we shrink what we talk about at the beginning of the meeting, the document would be great. Um, I think because documentation is awesome. <laughs> um, but I think having something folks can read, um, cause you know, not everybody listens to the spiel at the beginning. I, and I understand that. Um, I, I feel like it would be ideal if everyone who is in the meeting could add themselves to the notes document, regardless of whether they're speaking or lurking. And that is really happening like 99%. Yeah. Um, so yeah, people are doing great and we really appreciate that. So I, I, that's how I feel it should go. Um, and like I said, since it is happening like 99% of the time, that's amazing. Um, it's super helpful for whoever's taking the notes because otherwise we have to like scramble through and um, hope that we get everybody. Um, so we don't miss anyone when there's actually like folks who want to talk. Um, and that's left to the notes taker, which is typically Jeff or myself or Melissa. Um, so it's, I, I, I'm, I'm asking that as a notes taker that I think that that it would be the most ideal way to do it. Um, as for shrinking down what we say in the beginning, um, I don't know, Scott, do you have an opinion on that? I think this this all sounds good to me. If we just had a doc and we just say, go to this link, it's fine with me. Um, Deshipu makes a point about not recording the introduction. Um, that's, yeah, I, I can see that. Do a quick introduction and then start the recording with the relevant information or information relevant to folks who are listening to it at a later date. Um, oh, that's true. I, I was thinking about the opposite. What if we pre-recorded the introduction and pasted it on? I was thinking, I don't want to open up my video editor to, to produce the video, no. but it was the opposite. And yeah, that is a reasonable idea. I don't know how many people are listening to this after the fact, but yeah, some of that is not the most helpful for them. So that's definitely a good idea. Just, yeah, just if that's excellent. Um, so I think I think these are things to consider. We can rework the um, running the meeting document to change up the what the intro looks like and just put a, like a pre-intro in that document so we still know what we want to say, but and then change up what the actual recorded intro sounds like. Um, and we can just give that. I think Jeff, you're running it next time, so we could give it a test. Yes. We could we could work on it this week and then give it a test next week and see how it goes. Okay. Uh, is the new document like a markdown in the weekly meeting repo or is it a Google Doc? Um, I like the idea of it being um, a markdown document in the, in the weekly meeting repo because then uh, we can all kind of contribute to it if we say, you know, it's, it's, it's all in one place, I guess. Mm -hmm. And since that's where the notes document goes and we're kind of discussing, you know, how to handle the notes document and so on in it, um, I think it's a great place for it. All right, I will put together a pull request and uh, mention you, Katni, mm -hmm. and Scott yep. on it, and we'll get it into shape this week and kind of trial it next week. All right, sounds good. And 
thanks in advance to everybody for kind of working with us as we work on our process a little bit. I, I hope that we improve things as we're doing this. Mm -hmm. Thanks for taking it on. All right. All right. Next up. Um, oh, no, David, we're not changing how you do things. We're changing how we talk about how you do things. <laughs> It's just when we tell you what to do. It's not we're not changing up anything for how you're going to do it. But that is a valid point. We will definitely let you know ahead of time, way ahead of time, if things change on how we expect everyone to participate. Well, I think we may be changing it just slightly, um, in that if we if we're no longer asking people to announce in the channel that they're lurking, but we're saying if you're going to speak, we need you to put your your placeholder in the dock at a minimum. That mm -hmm. is going to be a slight change. But you're doing that, David. You are doing great. And yeah, you, you don't have to worry. But it is important to be clear when we are changing things. And I'll definitely call call that out. But I've been kind of doing this thing for a while mm -hmm. um, my way. And people have been rolling with it. And it's been fine. So yeah. Yep. OK. Sounds good. Um, I'll look for that PR. All right, next up is Deshipu. Okay, so uh, as I have ported uh, now two games to the uh, display I/O library, I noticed that there is a pretty annoying problem with uh, different uh, boards that we have that can run those games, having completely different pins, often completely different ways to access the buttons or the uh, the names of the sound pin are different. Sometimes you need to unmute the, the amplifier and sometimes not, and so on. And I was thinking maybe we could have uh, something similar that the state library has with the micro game, uh, the ugame.py uh, file uh, being frozen into the uh, relevant board that uh, does all the setup for you and uh, just gives you a standard, standardized uh, API basically for for the most common uh, the most basic uh, functions in there basically the buttons the, uh, the the sound and the display <clears throat> it would also initialize the display if it's not done automatically on that board and so on uh, of course uh, we would need to uh, do some uh, experimenting and research and uh, discussion about how that API should look like exactly. But I think that would uh, make it much simpler to to make uh, portable, uh, not not just games, uh, applications in general. My feeling on this is that I really don't like freezing Python in, so I don't think that. I, I what I feel is like you're finding these cases where board the board definitions aren't correct. Um, where pin names are different. Like my my assumption is that or my thinking is that like the names in boards should be uniform enough that like we could have a standard library that that does initialization based purely on what's in board. Um, and that will be it, it'll be one file to include with every game, but like so okay, but, uh, there are cases where sometimes you need gamepad, sometimes you need gamepad shift, sometimes you you have an analog joystick and you need to translate that into directions somehow. Like that's that's all board like board pin naming. And then if there's really specific cases, like then the Python code should know what board it is. Like uh, so, so, so you want to have a library that would look at the board file and from the names included in it, guess which board it right. is and, and then right. initialize everything. Right. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, that, uh, I guess that would work. Right, it sounds like that's most of what your problem is. Is like if there's inconsistency in board, like we should just be better about having board naming be consistent. Uh, yeah, so 
I, I don't like the idea of, of having one one big library that kind of uh, has to know about every single board out there in existence. I would prefer to every single board know about itself. But uh, this is not really... I, 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 I suppose I need to think about it. Too. Yeah, I, I, I like... I can see where you're going, right? Like the way that we just do displays now, like we initialize the display once up front and that's fine. So like maybe there is a maybe there maybe there's an argument to be made that we should just have like a board.gamepad that initializes gamepad or gamepad shift or whatever. Um maybe that's a better way to go. I don't know. One, one thing I, I noticed, like the, the API for gamepad shift and gamepad is sort of the same. Mm -hmm. And maybe that could be merged and the the compilation process would decide whether or not to use shift. Does that make sense, Radomir? Well, we, we never know if people are using this with the onboard uh, teams or with uh, some something they connect from. Outside. I see. I see. Okay. So it's not it's not obvious from the board choice of boards which to use. Okay. Well, uh, if you if you initialize it yourself, you initialize it with with the pins on the board, and then you know which one to use. But people can use those libraries with their own stuff as well. Okay. They don't have to use it only with the pins on the board. Right. All right. Yeah, I don't. Th I don't think we actually have a way to get the board ID at this point, which I I would be interested in. Should, like that seems that actually seems like it might be useful. I don't know. Maybe that opens up a can of worms on the library end, where it's sort of like an excuse to like do a bunch of specific stuff per board. Right. But right. I, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But it might. It seems like a nice little piece of infrastructure to have that. The, the board name. The board is available from UNAME. OS that you name the string name, the string not the name, folder, yeah. not the folder name, which I consider like the ID. Yeah. So, so originally, games for for the PC, at least for IBM PC, originally, uh, the games would have an installer, and they would ask you what kind of graphic cards do you have, what kind of of uh, a sound card you have, at which address, and so on. And uh, they would save that in a in a file once your game is installed. And uh, I wonder maybe 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 we could have a kind of uh, mm, website where you select those options, select your board, select what you connect to this, and it would uh, generate the this Python file for you that gives you the the. Uh, initialization of all the peripherals that you need. Maybe that would be the right. I've always been somewhat interested in actually having that, may, having an option maybe for that even being built into CircuitPython to have some way of actually getting more information about the stats of the board that you're using. So you have a little bit of really basic documentation about what your actual board stats are. So we, we actually have a little bit of that in the UF2 bootloader because it was originally made for the make code arcade and it knows how to access the buttons and it knows how to initialize the display. And it's it's saved there in, in some configuration area of the bootloader so we could uh, access that. Right, for some boards, not all boards. The ones that have uh, built-in display, basically, which is the ones that you want to use for games. Right. I don't know. I'd really like to see how far we could get with standardizing board names, names of board. Like, there shouldn't be any board that has a built-in display that is not initialized and provides a board dot display. Like, they should all always do that. We're also not been perfectly good about keeping them consistent, <laughs> which might be the root problem here. 
I mean, that, that could also be kind of a documentation thing, like guidelines for building a game board, right? Like right. naming, right. here's what you should name it. Like, I, I don't, if we don't have a standards sheet, we can't hold people accountable to following a standard. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to write such a library that tries to guess which is okay. which and, and initialize that. And we can then revisit this. Uh, I will see what kind of problems I run in. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks. All right. Excellent. Uh, next up, I have a topic from Jerry. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah, so just uh, this is something Jeff asked uh, to suggest we follow up with this in here. There's been this ongoing little issue with the um, uh, RP2040 and with the NeoPixel um, implementation. And and between Mark Gambler and Jeff, I think I think it sounds like Jeff, the, the latest fix fixes it for everybody but me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it turns out, you know that uh, other people don't seem to be able to reproduce the problem and that I, I was able to but then i cheapishly realized that i had a board with a bunch of other things attached to it and when i disconnected the, the other things from my board lo and behold now i can't reproduce the problem anymore so it does look like you know jeff's latest fix really does fix the problem but adding some other devices to the board may or may not be reintroducing it so I don't know if, if that's something we want to. Yeah, anyone has any ideas to what what might <laughs> why that might be, and whether we should be worried about it? What Jeff, devices? More to that? What devices? So what I what I had on my board was I had an airlift connected, so I had okay. something uh, you know SPI device not being used, it's just connected. Um, and I also have a couple a pair of pull up resistors on. Um, on GP0 and GP1 that I had been using for a previous test for uh, an ITC device. And I have a button connected from run to, run to ground so that I can mm -hmm. reboot the board. So those, th those three things are installed on that setup. But when I pulled the Pico off and just ran it bare, it, it works fine. So I don't really know which one of those is causing the problem yet. I haven't got, been able to go back and see which one. I, I assumed it was the airlift, but I don't know why. <laughs> so to complicate it a little bit more, I've had it occur without anything else hooked up. But I was using a second Raspberry Pi as the cheap logic analyzer to try to capture this. And as soon as I do that, it stops and it works fine, uh, which seems normal for a problem. <laughs> well, so you do add more capacitance to the line right. if you make the wire longer, basically. Yeah, I, I figured it's something like that. And what it seems to be, because on my case, I can definitely, I have the last pixel in the string lit up to full brightness. And I can see it dim whenever the first pixel lights up. So it's like it's losing the last one or two bits. I'm not sure how many. Dimming that somewhat. And that's being put in the first couple bits of the first pixel, which would light it up bright green. And what I saw when, I, when this problem first cropped up, cropped up I um, put the, my logic analyzer on, and you could see that there were definitely some gaps in the in the transmission. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if if adding capacitance is sort of somehow causing more more gaps to appear. No, I mean I think we understand that the gap was there because of only putting one byte in before doing background tasks. And that would that's at the code level and not the physical right. level where you get capacitance. Right. So so I guess my, my question was is is adding other pins and things like that possibly causing something similar, uh, delays or some sort of just basically mistransmissions. So are these two completely independent problems that we should go ahead and you know declare declare it fixed for the issue at hand and see if we have another issue that has to do with too many things being going on, connected. From what I found on the weekend, I think there's definitely two different issues. Yeah. The one with the non-DMA doing background tasks was definitely a separate issue that I could reproduce a totally different way. This first pixel 
and to me, I've only had the first pixel act strange, and I guess the last pixel dim. Um, that seems to be a different issue. How many pixels do you have? Is it a power issue? Right now, I'm only using four. Okay, so it should yeah, be. I've and I've been having the problem with just you know two two or three pixels. I only have seven on this device that's hooked up, so it shouldn't be power. Yeah, I thought about the power issue. Um, and yeah, like I've got it sitting in front of me right now. And if I pull the wire off to the second Pico, the first LED just starts blinking green, not constantly, but fairly often. Oh, so um, I know what it could be. The way that we do NeoPixels is that we we only drive the line when we're transmitting, otherwise we don't. No, that's not. Wondering if... But is it because the Wait. state machine deinitializes itself in the NeoPixel when it's done? Is that happening a fraction too soon or too late or something? Well, that was a bug I had right at the start. <laughs> <laughs> that that should be fixed, but it could be that you know what we really should like because it's handed a digital in out. Like we should make sure that the digital in out state is left asserting low. Um, otherwise, if we, if we switch to being an input, the pin will be floating, and any sort of noise on that pin may be interpreted by the NeoPixel as further transmission. So the other item that Lamore uh, has brought up each time we talked about this internally is the supply voltage. Uh, and the tolerance of that. So um, I think we covered this in a previous discussion, but to run the NeoPixels off of the regulated 3 point whatever volts instead of off the USB 5 volts and just exclude that as a possible cause. Yeah, I've been I, running I off the 3.3. The, the original problem, I thought it didn't matter. I got the same results on both, but... Um... And then there were some complaints some other people had, and I think another same thing that you tend to get flicker on the three volts. At least I did. <laughs> hmm. So yeah, I would I would I would check. Let, let's make sure that it's not floating in between transmissions. Yeah, that's my guess. Especially Mark for your case where it's like, oh, if I attach a wire, it's fine. Like that'll change yeah. its susceptibility to noise. Yeah, I'll take a look at that. I, I see the. I'm looking at the code right now, and I yeah. And I don't know if it's related. It I found I noticed that with the board when I had all those other devices connected, it would spuriously dis disconnect from USB every once in a while. I'd be sitting there all of a sudden, and hear the little little, you know, sound mm -hmm. that it disconnected. And um, I hadn't really thought much about that or tried to debug it, but it hasn't happened since I since I unplugged everything. <laughs> so. so that also may be triggering some noise on, on, especially since I had that reset line connected to the run line. Right. So what I would I would suspect is maybe the reset line needs to be pulled. Um, right. Like if your reset line is floating as well, you're going to have that problem. Um, like. So would you you physically would put a pull up resistor on it, or? I would just try that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think there's one on the board. I, think. I assume there is, but it's possible it's like too weak or something for a longer wire. I don't know. Okay. I don't know, okay. but I think I think once we once we take a look at it, we should be willing to just merge them in and then just kind of like let it soak and see how it goes. Yeah, well, I was going to suggest that we go ahead and just you know. Declare <laughs> declare victory on the on the initial issue, which clearly made a lot of sense. That was that was a good catch, right. and yeah. uh, and and you know and move on, and then open you know if the other issue persists, we can uh, start a new issue. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, for sure. Um, sounds like we got that as sorted as we're going to get it for now. Uh, next up, I have a topic from Mark. Yeah, this is just a follow-up on the parallel bus. I left um, a note on the review mm -hmm. with how we initialize the which pins are for outputs. Right. 
I'm not sure if you had a chance to read that yet, Scott, but uh, where I ran into is the PIO only seems to be able to set right. five pin directions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think what you have to do is you have to figure out how to, like, you, you basically have to do it throughout. So either you could, like, put one, you know, value into the into the TX FIFO and then read it in and then write it to the pin directions. Like, so. Okay, yeah. So just use out pin directions and then write. Oh, write to the FIFO. I think that would work, yeah. 256, really. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever you need. Eight pins. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what you have to do. I think you write you you force execute the out that will block, and then you can write to the FIFO the value that you want to go to pin directions, and that should work. Okay, I haven't tried setting pin directions with out, but yeah, if it's in the TX FIFO, it should just. Yeah, I think that's I think that's what you want. Okay, I will try that to see if that goes anywhere. Because yeah, I ran out of possibilities using the set command. That... <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> but yeah, I think you could do it without. Yeah, I can try that then. That's all I wanted to check on. Cool. Excellent. Thank you. Next up, I have a topic posed by Jay Fersian, who's lurking, so I will read it off. Um, adding Raspberry Pi Pico bus IO dot I squared C bus IO dot SPI uh, PR4157. This is on the Circuit Python repo. Um, they would be interested in hearing a discussion on this. And I believe we actually intended to talk about this. Um, but we uh, slipped up and didn't add it. So it's good that this was added by somebody else. Um, what are our thoughts on this? So I could summarize since I opened the PR. Sounds good. Um, of the issue. So um, there are no pins marked as I2C or SPI or whatever on an, a Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, the book, the sort of the 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 beginner's book, uh, has a few examples. Um, it has an example. It has examples for I2C and it has examples for SPI. It does not have any examples for UART, and they use certain pins. And they, they, the, the examples are written in MicroPython. Uh, separate than that, there are the way that MicroPython works is that it has default pins for each separate peripheral. So on the Raspberry, on the RP2040, there are two I2C peripherals. There are I guess two, two SPI, I can't remember. Correct. And so there's a default set of pins for the zeroth I2C and the first I2C and the same for the two SPIs. And those pins are different from the ones used in the book. Okay. Of course they are. Yeah. And there, so there's no obvious thing to do. We, we decided that since the book is... The, and the and the the spec the the Raz, the MicroPython spec lists these default pins, but they're in a document that most people are not going to read. The average person is not going to read necessarily. So, especially the average person doing Circuit Python. So uh, we just said, well, we need we, we'd like to come up with some default pins because we have a lot of examples that use uh, board.i2c and board.spi and eventually board.uart when we implement yes, we uart. Do. Yeah. And so the question was, which pin should we use? And Lamore suggested use the ones in the beginner's book because they're obvious, because everybody will say, can I redo these examples in CircuitPython? And so that we chose uh, some pins based on those examples. And that's what the current pull request has in it. Um, uh, yeah? I, oh, sorry. Well, I, I just well, I, I wanted to chime in on this. Um, hopefully not derailing anything, but um, because we had a very similar thing come up recently with the STM32 uh, black pill, which is not a very widely used board, but also doesn't have any markings of any kind for I2C. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, somebody put together a, a, a PR to add I2C pins or the default 
I squared D pins uh, that just match the feather. And there wasn't really any justification for adding those other than the feather uses these as a um, as a default. And without them, they couldn't run the examples. And and what I thought was noteworthy about that is because they thought the conclusion they had reached at a, as a beginner was because it did not have a default I squared C, it did not have I squared C or did not have it. Um, and or or that it was a bug that it was missing and and I I thought that was a little bit of a of an I don't know I, I it just it was like it, it seems like a slippery slope to me having this weird dependence on boards having I squared C and you know SPI built in to be like valid for our examples like I just, I don't know I, it it made me. Well, well, we put in the defaults because it's a lot more convenient and people make fewer mistakes. So, um, and so that, for instance, feathers just stack and they work perfectly without having to specify which pins or you don't put them in the wrong order or anything like that. So I think having the defaults is good for our boards, which we designed to have defaults. And then the question is, well, are we going to let... Do we want our examples to help support other third-party boards that don't have defaults? And so I, I think it's my my feeling is it goes to sort of cat toward Cadney is that a lot of people cut and paste code, and if they're going to do that, let them try it, and and they'll say like, but which pins are the I two C pins, and then it, that will lead them to answer that question. But otherwise, they basically don't know where to get started. And they say, my code doesn't work. And we say, that's because there isn't an SEL. You know, there is no board.i2c. It's really convenient to have these singleton uh, ob lazy evaluation objects. I think everybody agrees with that. And I think, but it's, and it's too bad that third par party boards aren't thinking about marking default pins. So. I mean, I think in some cases, it, I mean, it, it's leading people to actually misinterpret the documentation to be implying that the boards have less capability than they actually do. But we're not going to take those away. So. Right. Well, but I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I would, I would just be thinking about like, is there some way that we could signal to them, uh, to, to, to people who are using the examples? Uh, that there are alternatives available that actually do the same thing. So, so like using using a, a, a bus io dot i squared c board dot b six board dot b seven or something like that. You know, to to let them know that there's there's an example that is an alternative to using the i squared c where the example will still work. Um, um, so the CircuitPython Essentials Guide has an i squared c page, and on that i squared c page is a script that you can run that spits out all of your possible I squared C pins. Um, we point folks to that already for that solution. There's one for SPI as well and one for UART, um, a script I mean. Um, so we sort of already have something like that documented. I don't know if this if that's like an, enough for what you're talking about, but like that's kind of what we've been doing so far. Uh, kind of like the idea here, actually. What? Since there are no labels. But. Oh, sorry. Well, I was just noting what Jeff has said in the chat here, which is adding an error message for boards that don't have a default bus io.i squared c that actually gives them an attribute error, instructs them to create their own, and maybe even gives them, you know, yeah, a bus, it, it, it directs them to resources for creating their own I2C bus based off of the available I2C pins instead of using this default. And I I, I don't know. I, I think that having that built in would actually make a big difference. I think that would be pretty good. I'm not sure this can be done or not, but that was kind of what came to mind. It would remain an attribute error. So has adder would return false, or your try accept would do the right thing um, and raise an error that is the right kind of error, but it would give you information that tells you how to continue on usefully. And I think that's kind of been a common thread that we've tried to do through error handling in CircuitPython is put yeah, put the user in the right the circuit, direction. But CircuitPython has gone down a, a, a path of, of doing a lot of 
hand holding and a lot of a lot of shortcut taking to make things easy. And you know, clearly using a using the Pico, it's going to have to be explained what pins to use. Uh, wiring diagrams are going to need to be added for any 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 application, any example, because there's nothing marked on the board. There's no way of knowing what SDA and SCL are. But picking a, a set. And, and allowing people to use board.itc certainly makes things simpler and makes makes a lot of example if you do wire it up the way you have to, which you're going to have to learn to do anyway. Even to use bus IO, you're going to have to read read the you know the learn learn where where they are, or you know again follow some instructions to wire them up. But if you do that, then it opens up a whole lot of examples automatically that that will work. So I mean I think. You know, we've gone down that path already to 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 you know make adding this 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 um, I don't know what what you call it you know this this shortcut yeah. that uh, that is really nice. So I'm kind of leaning that you know it's really not I don't think it's a bad thing to include it. People don't have to use it, but they are going to have to educate themselves as to how to know how to figure out what pins to use. So. Um. Yeah, I, I I think the trouble is I, when most boards we don't actually have a learn guide that tells people what the defaults are. So um, the Pico is an exception, um, right? The Cadney, I think you would say like in general there are only learn guides about um, so Blinka supported boards and Adafruit boards. Uh, and it kind of feels to me like we're just we're thinking we're only thinking about adding this because the Pico is popular. I mean, this could be done for literally any other board too. Um, you know, any number of the, the STM boards, the ESP32 boards, but we're only considering it for the Pico because we think a lot of people have Picos. Um, we know we thought a lot of people were going to buy Picos, and we sell them. Okay, yeah, so. Uh, I don't. I don't want us to make up for bad board design. Like, fundamentally, it's bad board design. And yeah, we should we should have docs that say if your board does not have board i two c, then here's how you do it. Otherwise, uh, yeah. I, 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 Carter, do you have anything to say about the amount of support that you expect to get in one case or the other? Well, at some point, people should buy a better board. Like... Uh -huh. Analytics computer. Yes, analytics computer. <laughs> he says from his Mac. Like I, there's there's a number of things that are bad about the Pico board, and I don't want like the thing that we talked about also is like if we do randomly pick a default bus what's stopping them from picking something different later and then just having all hell break loose right but what i don't get is isn't it, it the what we choose as the bus is in the background the user doesn't see that unless they're checking pins.c so at that point all hell breaks loose yeah but we change one thing and we fixed it right we fixed it but everybody else who was already using it is broken but you're using you're using board dot i squared c not the not the specific pins so it the any update we did in the background would just resolve all the issues wouldn't it it wouldn't come to your house and change the wiring of your existing project oh fair enough right. and 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 any existing documentation changes that they make are going to happen in real time right and I think that this is just generally like it's a it's an umbrella of coverage issue where it's just like this is a board that's, you know, not under our control and they could do anything. And I, I don't know. I, I'm kind of with Scott here. I just feel like this is not something that we should. Yeah, so, so what you're saying is if the board doesn't have Excel stream doesn't have an SDA and an SCL or, you know, the SPI pins or UART mark, then we don't provide board dot thing for it is that i think we right. need people to make i, I think it should, we should we should informatively point people to how to actually make one right um yeah and we could also change our examples to not use board.spy 
like in board.i squared c. Like we could have our examples use bus IO with board.scl and SDA. But I mean, that would be really nice to have those. And we want to encourage boards that do have them. So we, we just I went through we and should... changed all of that. Like, well, the reason the reason we introduced it in the first place was so that we could have libraries share an object without having to pass it all around, right? Right. But then it was pushed as as how to. It was pushed as canonical, I guess, is my point, and the guides reflect that. And it's canonical. It's what? Right, Scott. You faded out, Scott. Yeah, you lost. We lost you. So it still looks like you're speaking, but we can't hear anything. Point. There, there's room for making a better board. Um, you you cut out everything after canonical until room for making a better board. And and the RP the Feather RP twenty forty will be an example of that, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I you know I. I I'm all for you know encouraging users to to learn how to read the the, the pinout diagrams anyway. <laughs> so. Eco guide, we should say. Can you hear me still? I'm sorry. Yes. I switched yep. to my laptop. Yeah, you've been dropping in and out a bit. Yeah, because I'm on Wi-Fi. Um, I think in the Pico guide, we should explicitly call that out and say, if you see board dot i squared c, replace it with this. Um, and use GP numbers in that so it's clear what they have to replace if they wire it up differently. But isn't that just creating more work too? Because if those, you're saying if they change what is the default bus or whatever, we still have documentation well, to update. Right? Well, no, because they don't have the notion of a default bus. And so if, right. if in our getting started with Pico guide, we have all of the stuff that tells you where to like where to how to hook things up right like that's our own collateral like we're, we're not going to have this issue of, of us defining a default and them defining a default later right 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 the potential issue so I, I i think so an intermediate step an intermediate fix is to have these um pseudo constructors throw not implemented with an informative message yeah does that does that the, pro the problem with that is that if you do a get attribute to see if it's there it will pass yes kind of mm. and maybe we test that maybe maybe we can throw an attribute error and it looks the same maybe get attribute Ooh. <laughs> i don't know how to say yeah <laughs> but like if you do write code that says hey do you have a default i squared z bus and then that constructor actually raises an exception, then does it act the same way or not? Do we have code like that in the library academy? Do we have? Um, well, we were we were just talking about adding it for gamepad stuff. Right, right. Um, so I found this one in Adafruit Cricket. It checks if I2C in Dura of board, then construct a global Cricket object in the following way using board.i2c. Right. So right. if we, if time we time added it as a function that throws uh, not implemented error when it's called, then Adafruit Cricket.py becomes not importable on that board. And that's not great. Mm -hmm. Like it's up yeah, my opinion is that at some point it's up to the board designer to think about things like this. And if they didn't think about it when they labeled it, then that's not on us to. It's not on us to change the the behavior of Circuit Python. Right, right. I, I think that this is one of the first boards that is being used by non-experts in a wide way, and that's the problem. And I think you're right. It really is a. It's a development board, not a production board. <laughs> To, to large degree. Right. I mean, there are so many other problems with this board, like the silk markings are on the bottom, and the one and the two markings <laughs> on the top correspond to GPI of zero and one. You know, like just, it's, the, 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 the the labeling is. Right. So yeah, my pre my preference standards. would my preference would be to fix this in documentation. 
And we should, like like Jeff pointed out, we should fix the library that doesn't import if you have a board.i squared z missing. Like, that shouldn't happen. But I, I think we should just, like, it's good to know how to use bus IO. And so we should just teach that because that's what's required to use a Pico. OK. I, I, I'm not, I, I, I don't object that strongly to this position. And, and, or, and, and what it means is that when people, it's a support issue, but it also encourages people to buy boards that are better designed. So Yeah, that's my opinion on it. Yeah. Or it encourages them to read the, the uh, pinout diagrams and learn how to use them, which is fine right. too. Right. I mean, <laughs> I, I think it's just good to, to try and signal, you know, what's, what the action, if you're going to use a more advanced board, you know, you should be signaled that you should learn more about it. As opposed to just being signaled that like it's not valid for the thing that you're doing. Right, right. This board, unfortunately, though it's meant for beginners, is not has significant deficiencies when it comes to that. Right. So, but I, I think this this is a good catalyst for the discussion. I mean, the other the, the other boards maybe they wouldn't come up with this issue as often, but I think it's it's a. I mean, what I what I expect to happen is that eventually Raspberry Pi will redo the silk. I would I would hope. Or something, but right, and I want I want them, <laughs> yeah. And but I also like if we paper over it now, then they may not realize they need to fix it in the next iteration. Yeah, I'm just also so not I sure think... that it's our entirely our responsibility to over document this board either. Um, right, I think indicating that more information can be found by you know checking the pinout diagram or something to that effect might make more sense. Um, mm -hmm. Just based on okay. the the based on the content of the guide that you're suggesting adding it to, there's not really a good place to add it. Is my point? Well, mm -hmm. there is the gotcha, right? Like there is the FAQ. Yeah, it we can toss it in right. there. It could go yeah. in there, and that's kind of like that'll be our catch-all for like, oh, this doesn't work on Pico. We send them there, and then they can see all the. Yeah, the I already requested that all of our um, support folks keep an eye out for repeated issues. Yep. So. All right, so I'm willing to close the issue in the PR. Sounds good. You put a note in that they, that they renamed Mozi and Mizo to SPI, TX, and RX, which is very confusing, I think. Yes, that's a good point, too. Right. So right. I, think, I mean, it's the first time they've done this kind of thing, and they're, they're, they're on a learning curve. So, yeah. All right, all right. I'm, I'm willing to close the issue. I don't have, I'm not wedded to it. Jay Fersian is still typing, so. Yeah, I mean, David's talking about something interesting too, but we're almost to two hours. Yeah. There's a good discussion. Uh, there's a good discussion about what do you do when there's like a third level of indirection that we're having on the Blink uh, repo, so I can link that. That's That's the place to have that discussion. Okay. Um, All right. Sounds like we're we're good to go on this. Um, yeah. I have one final uh, in the weeds topic from Scott. Yeah. So it's just um, I have this test script for the audio output that like generates sine waves in like four different formats, and it seems like it's something we should have in a central location. And even Lucian was also talking about the cent the test scripts he has for um, socket stuff. So yeah, I was wondering, so should we so should we just make it? Should we just make a folder in Circuit Python that is like manual tests, and then slash the module name slash the test, and then like just comment how to how to use it. I mean, I'll, I will have I will fill up like almost every module with a test. I mean, I've I've got a lot of them, so. Um, I think I, I'm hugely in favor of this idea because I'd, I'd like to be able to track the tests across versions. Right. Um, because, you know, they, the specifics of them change and update over time. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, we would not have a lack of content because I've got a lot of them. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. the only thing is, is whether it belongs in, like, library examples or not. But I think it's right. in, in the case that, like, it's something that just uses the native module only, then we could put it in circuit Python proper. I think, I think that that's actually, I, I think that that's the um, reason I think it should be in circuit Python is that 
I, I'm my, most of my little raw tests aren't yeah. really appropriate to put in a learn guide or right. in a library because right. they're not really useful to people because everybody just uses the libraries. But for core maintainers who are trying to, you know, uh, test uh, reliability, that's like really like 90% of their purpose is just right. unit testing. So yeah. um, I don't think it makes sense to put them anywhere else. Uh, so I think, I think having a having our own little test folders okay so i think just like tests slash manual slash the module name right yeah we just have it's like shared bindings basically all the same folders right um, but just under tests right just under tests exactly yeah okay that's all i want all right cool. excellent i think with that we're going to wrap up because this has been a long meeting. Um, so this has been the Circuit Python Weekly for February eighth, uh, twenty twenty one. Um, thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, if you would like to support Adafruit and Circuit Python, and those of us that work at Circuit Py work on Circuit Python, considering purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit, visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held next Monday, as usual, I believe, um, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, it, this meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. And to be notified about the meeting or any changes to the day or time, you can be added to the Circuit Pythonistas role on Discord. Just let us know. And we hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Katni.